Hi, and welcome to Civs 101, the show where historians discuss Sid Meier's Civilization series. I'm your host, Bob Whitaker. On today's episode, we'll be looking at the Greeks, which is one of the original 14 Civs of the Civilization series. Most of the original 14 Civs from Civ 1 have kept their original leader throughout the series, but the Greeks, traditionally led by Alexander the Great, are now led by either Pericles or Gorgo, while Alexander has been made the leader of Macedon. To help me make sense of this cataclysmic change, and to consider the Greeks more generally in this game, I've invited on our old friend Kate Cook back onto the show. If you'll remember, Kate was our scholarly guest for our episodes on Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Total War Troy, and Hades. Kate also has a new edited volume under contract with Bloomsbury, focused on women in classical video games. Kate, welcome back to History Respawn. Hi, Bob. Thanks very much for having me again. Thanks for being here. Um, so, Kate, I'm kind of pitching this first question to all the scholarly guests that we have on the show. What is your experience with the Civilization series, and what do you make generally of the way it depicts the history of the world? <laughs> Well, I have got a fair amount of experience with this series, actually. Um, I had played a couple of the earlier ones, I think maybe three and four around friends' houses and so on, and then really started playing myself um, with Civ Five. at which point I sank many too many hours into that game, <laughs> um, particularly given it was kind of very popular while I was writing my PhD. So that's uh, a bad sign. <laughs> um, and then I moved on to Civ Six when that came out as well um, and have uh, fewer hours in Civ Six so far, but there is still time. So I've played quite a lot of the Civilization, the most recent Civilization games. I'm sure the lack of hours in Civ Six has probably helped your academic career quite a bit. <laughs> well, yes, and given me time to do things like talk about video games instead of playing them. <laughs> um, in terms of how it presents history and the past, I think... Um, I mean, there are there are sort of good things and bad things here. I, as a game, I really like it. Obviously, that's why I play it all the time. Um, but I do think the impression of the past that it gives is is sometimes problematic. Particularly, the um, there are two things that I worry about. One of which they've just fixed. Um, so I'll do that one first, and that is the barbarians in this game. Mm -hmm. I am not comfortable with the idea that you can either be a major civilization with a leader that we know of, or you can just be totally uncivilized and the idea that if you're nomadic you know you have you have no no culture worth having and and your only purpose is to be wiped off the map so that the major right. civilizations can take that space that is deeply problematic <laughs> i understand it as kind of a game development point of view because it, it sets up a little enemy no, for you to no, no. fight but i still think that is an issue for mm -hmm. me. So I'm really glad I haven't played yet the new update that changes that, where you can have meaningful relationships with the the non-major civilizations in the map. Um, but I'm really excited to see how that improves things. Mm -hmm. um, and then I suppose the other thing which um, gives me some pause in terms of impression of uh, the past is in fact what you've just opened up. Um, the way that you kind of handle progress in this game and the, the kind of suggestion that history is sort of a linear progression through various technologies into a golden age where everyone is basically the same as, as modern America. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the, you know, it just, there's something a little bit um, excessively uniform and a bit kind of simplistic in terms of the view of history mm -hmm. there. Again, I really understand it as a game dynamic because I think there are ways of doing it differently and we're seeing actually some new kind of alternatives to Civ coming out, like uh, Humankind is mm -hmm. one I've had my eye on for a while, that are trying to do different things to this. Um, and I completely understand that this makes a nice straightforward system for players and it, and it gives you kind of something to aim at and play through. Um, but I think it does give a very simplified view of how... Um, how we move through time, really, both mm -hmm. in terms of the linear movement of it all and in terms of the relationship between, uh, I suppose, individual progress and individual societies and mm -hmm. these kind of ideas of what progress looks like. And then also these ideas of distinct eras. We've got classical era here, medieval era, 
uh, Renaissance era and then going into industrial and modern. And so they're, they're kind of shown here as kind of walls almost as though <laughs> there's not a blending or uh, a mixing of those kind of periods of history. So uh, yeah, a lot lot that is uh, troubling about the way that the game sets up um, this past. But at the same time, this is a, a very addicting game, and I think one that uh, is the introduction to a lot of these kind of concepts to players. So on the one hand, it is it is disturbing, troubling, but on the other hand, it, it maybe serves as a window uh, for somebody to get more interested into the backstory of, of these kind of historical ideas. Mm. And I do like, I should say, I like when you research these things and you get one of those little um, quotes up in this game, as we've just been saying, read by uh, Sean Bean, but um, <laughs> in kind of some of the others, not with so much narration. Um, but that kind of helps you connect some of these developments into um, the historical context a little bit. So I quite like that as a, as you say, as a sort of pointer to going and exploring more things about history and, you know, where when these people first start writing about writing, Mm -hmm. where all these quotes are coming from. Mm -hmm. I can see that that's kind of nice as a little spur for curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we are playing this game, obviously, because of your historical expertise. Uh, we're playing as the Greeks. Um, like I said at the top, the Greeks are one of the original Civs, but there's a big change uh, with Civ Six, and that's uh, Alexander the Great has been removed uh, as the leader of the Greeks, and he's been replaced by either uh, Pericles or Gogo. And uh, we are playing as Gorgo here. Uh, we've got our capital city of Sparta. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you know, given your expertise, what do you make of this switch uh, from our old friend Alexander? And I'll pull up the leaders here. Alexander. And our switch into uh, new leaders of uh, Gorgo uh, and then Pericles down here. And I'll, I'll just leave the screen here on Gorgo. I think it's an interesting change. Um, I think this this could have gone either way, really, when um, the developers first started making this move, because how people see Alexander and whether they see him as a Macedonian figure, um, because he was originally from Macedon, um, or whether he's a Greek figure is actually obviously in contemporary politics still contested, and in contemporary politics, given the history of the Greek Civil War and so on, is is quite a high stakes question. So to some extent, it looked a little bit like they were wading into this debate by saying that Alexander is is no longer Greek. Mm -hmm. um, which, which could have been quite a strong political statement. Although, having said that, you don't actually get much of an impression of any kind of Macedonian civilization from Alexander. You just get <laughs> a kind of Alexander and his allies, right? This is just Alexander land that we've got now here as, as the kind of society. Um, particularly the units, for example, the fact that the units are the companion cavalry. This is just Alexander's bodyguards and friends. This mm -hmm. is not a kind of specific Macedonian unit. It's an Alexander unit. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and then they, you know, they kind of avoided making any strong political statements, which is probably not a bad idea, given that it is um, an issue which is, which has the potential to upset quite a lot of people. Um, but then the switch to kind of having Gorgo and Pericles as the representatives of, of Greece is quite interesting as well, because what we've really got here is uh, Sparta and Athens. We haven't necessarily got Greece. Mm -hmm. Um and the choice of these two figures, I think, is quite interesting as well, um, particularly to some extent Gorgo. I think it's quite, in some ways, it's quite natural that when people think classical Greeks, they think Athens and Sparta, because we know a lot more about these societies, although we don't know enough about Sparta. Um, but we know more about them than than other places. And particularly, they keep coming up in popular culture, especially the clash between Athens and Sparta, that is the Peloponnesian War, is something which has been returned to again and again in popular culture. So it doesn't surprise me that much that we've got Sparta and Athens rather than, say, I don't know, Greek Thebes and Corinth representing the Greek people, because I suspect these are places that people will identify with. <laughs> But I do find Gorgo is a curious selection. Um, I'm pleased. You know, it's nice to see some more women leaders, so that's fine. But we don't have very much information about her at all in her original context, unlike Pericles, who we've got a lot of mm -hmm. information about. Yeah. I mean, at, at least for this period, we've got, you know, plenty of, of history of him. Um, we haven't for Gorgo. We've got a few mentions of her 
acting as an advisor to her husband and her father in Sparta. And then a couple of quotes from Plutarch of, of kind of striking things she apparently said. And that's pretty much it. We don't know much about her beyond the, these kind of few stories. So why her rather than another Spartan leader, I think is possibly because of the influence of films like 300, where they mm -hmm. really picked up on Gorgo as a kind of a figure that they could do a lot with and, and put into the film. So I think it seems to me what we're seeing is kind of a pop culture idea of a Greek leader, mm -hmm. particularly coming in here with Gorgo. And again, you know, I, I to some extent I understand that because it, if it's what the players will know, you know, they might they're more likely to have seen the the film Three Hundred than read Herodotus's histories. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a that good that's bet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Really, given you know the audience of this game is massive these days. Um, there's probably not that many of them going through things like Roger just looking for the three brief mentions of, of Gorgo versus other Spartan leaders they might find more about. So I think it is the kind of, it's, you know, pop culture ideas of, of who is important are really shaping this choice of leader for, for Gorgo, at least, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think it does, it gives the players something that they can latch onto that they may be aware of, kind of pop history of Athens versus Sparta. And then also, I think it's interesting from a gameplay perspective, you do get slightly different abilities uh, in different uh, approaches uh, for Pericles and for Gorgo. So they're both pretty adaptable civilizations. Uh, but as you can see, there's a bunch of bonuses related to them based on culture, uh, which is one of the kind of victory mechanics uh, for Civilization VI and you know, for most of the Civilization series from uh, Civ three onwards. And uh, but we get a slight difference here. We've got uh, Gorgo. Uh, she's got a benefit for culture based on combat, whereas Pericles has got a benefit for culture based on uh, relationship with city states. So based on diplomacy. Um, so I think you know there's kind of a an obvious desire I think from the developer's perspective to give you a, um, a kind of a different option. For this very popular civilization, you know, Greece is one of the more popular uh, civilizations that players play. Um, and to give you a, a male and female option, but then also, I think, to in terms of gameplay, uh, to give you a slightly different uh, way of approaching uh, a kind of a Greek playthrough of Civilization VI through either combat or one that's kind of just truly focused on diplomacy uh, and culture. Mm. And I mean, to some extent, these are attached to uh, ideas about the real societies. I mean, I'm trying to word this cautiously because <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> because we've talked about this before, actually. The real problem, particularly with Sparta, is that we have very little evidence for Sparta. And most of what we have is Athenians talking about how weird Spartans are. Mm -hmm. So the idea of Spartans, and particularly Spartan women, as being really kind of centered on, on combat and, and kind of everything being about creating these, these uh, Spartan soldiers and and um, Athenians, by contrast, being sort of diplomatic and putting together the Delian League, which the Athenians present as kind of a positive diplomatic trait, and others put to get, uh, call kind of the putting together of the Athenian Empire um, in quite a negative way. Um, these are, you know, these are. These are very Athenian views of what the differences between <laughs> Sparta and Athens are. Um, so I think, you know, it's it, again, it's understandable that we see them here because these are the kind of things that people will associate with these societies. And it does, as you say, it does give you kind of some nice variety for, for playing with. Um, I'm not sure there were many alternatives. I, I was just going to ask you that. Yeah, I was going to ask you, is there anybody that you could think of that would be a, a better alternative, uh, but that would still fit into this kind of pop history uh, perspective that they like to touch on? I mean, I suspect the alternative would be Leonidas. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, you still are basically in the same kind of situation here, just with a male <laughs> leader. Um, so, uh, is that? I think that would probably be the other place they would go. Mm -hmm. So, I'm quite glad. I'm quite pleased that they've gone with Gorgo instead of that, because, um, as we know, I'm interested in women in these games. So, I think having a woman is is quite a nice change. Mm -hmm. Did you get a chance to watch any of the videos of Gorgo? I mean, one of the weird things about picking her as a uh, 
as the player characters. You don't get to see any of the videos of her um, kind of talking uh, in this game. I didn't know if you got a chance to uh, to see any of that. Uh, I have come up against her before um, in my own place. So I've seen videos of her. Particularly, she she waves a weapon at you quite a lot, yes. doesn't she? Yes. Yeah, she's quite aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I I think that's one of the more frustrating things about this game for me is that you don't get to see uh, your own player character. Uh, I mean, you do get to. I mean, you can click here, but then there's there's no action uh, that comes across, and so that's a it's a little bit frustrating. You basically have to go through and play the game as somebody else in order to interact uh, with you know or to actually see your favorite uh, Civ in action. So it's. Uh, a little bit frustrating. Maybe a note uh, for Civ 7, which I'm sure will be announced any month now. Um, all right, well, let's uh, let's move on to this uh, very short topic of the idea of civilization and as it pertains <laughs> uh, to the Greeks. Now, when I posed this question to you uh, in our planning stage uh, for this episode, uh, you were uh, taken aback a little bit saying, how could I possibly talk about this? Uh, in just uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So um, the, the question I've got is uh, the idea of civilizations, uh, you know, this kind of basis for this game, it harkens back to a different era of historical study that's based around largely arbitrarily constructed groups of people, uh, usually living in the ancient era, which is uh, what we're playing through uh, right now. And in these terms, Greece often represents the definitive civilization, especially when you're talking about civilizations in the Western world. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, is the idea of a Greek civilization, is that still one that carries weight with scholars? Yes. So this is, a, yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, you often also get Greece referred to as sort of the cradle of civilization yes. as well, don't you? Which is another um, kind of way in which these these concepts attract themselves together. Um, and I think there are there's uh, one more political way of talking about this and one less political. So we'll start with the less political and I'll work up my courage to get to the political. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because I think in particularly modern scholarship, there has been a lot more recognition of the differences between Greek city-states and how that makes talking about sort of Greek civilization a bit complicated. Because I think particularly if you talk about, um, again, if we just go back to sort of pop culture or sort of widespread ideas of what does Greek civilization mean, for many people, they'll say, oh, well, democracy. But many Greek states were not democratic. In fact, Sparta is not a democratic state. Um, and so many of these ideas that get kind of lumped under Greek civilization actually, again, are very often Athenian. Mm -hmm. And so one place that scholarship has really made a lot of progress, I would say, you know, even in, in the last 50 years, this is not kind of very recent progress, is to explore some of these non-Athenian cities um, and it kind of in the field of ancient history and try and broaden out our understanding of what does it mean to be Greek, not just by equating that to Athenian. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and then you can still talk about, you know, the ways in which these various different places were similar, you know, shared Greek language, although the dialects are different, the kind of sharing of Greek language, the basic aspects of some of the religion are sort of shared. Um, and of course, they do occasionally work together, most famously in the Persian War, although not all Greek city-states were on the Athenian slash Greek side in the Persian Wars either. So um, there's, you know, some some complication there, even just seeing them as a sort of Greek monolith. Mm -hmm. The more complicated side of this question and the more political side of this question is when we get to these ideas of, of Greece as a kind of cradle of modern civilization mm -hmm. or Western civilization, however, um, because very recently in classics, there has been a lot of work that is demonstrating, um, I think very convincingly, the fact that this language often comes with some deeply problematic modern politics. Mm -hmm. um, and Rebecca Futo Kennedy is someone who's done a lot of very good writing on this recently, that the idea of Greece as a kind of uh, a foundation of Western civilization often comes with quite racist politics. Mm -hmm. It's a way of kind of pointing to white Europeanism as superior. Um, 
and it starts in the 19th century, but that kind of continues on now. And I think at the moment, the field of classics is working quite hard to work against that. Not everywhere. There are some some groups within classics who think this is um, an inheritance that we should be proud of and don't accept the more problematic aspects of it. But there is quite a lot of modern work going on now to say, well, um, firstly, this is not a very accurate representation of, of sort of Greece. And then secondly, the idea that there's some sort of unbroken chain of civilization stretching from Greece down to America in particular um, is itself enormously problematic and is a concept which is employed only in problematic ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there has been kind of quite a lot of pushing back against that as well. So it is still, it is a very hot topic for us at the moment, but not because it's kind of holding sway in the same ways, more because the the boundaries of the concept and the ways in which it, it's wrong or it doesn't apply are really attracting a lot of discussion mm-hmm. lately. Mm -hmm. It seems like a conversation that may have been a long time in coming, right? I I mean, I can think of uh, taking uh, classics uh, university level and and not really having these kind of topics brought up. It's just kind of a a steady diet of the traditional texts, the traditional way of uh, understanding ancient Greece and understanding its import for the modern world. Uh, but it is interesting to hear that uh, classic scholars are looking at some of these uh, ideas and uh, considering about how uh, not just the ways in which that legacy of ancient Greece has um, had a major impact on the modern world, but thinking about the ways in which the modern world has developed and had an impact on the way in which we discuss uh, ancient Greece and ancient Greek civilization. I think that's, that's really fascinating. Mm. I mean, it's worth saying, you know, aspects of this discussion have been going on for a while. So when you first start getting feminist study in um, studies of ancient history and classics, for example, then there's a lot of um, work pushing back against the the kind of tre- the ways in which we think of Greek women. Um, and in fact, particularly if we go back to Gorgo, feminists have had a lot to say about the ways in which Spartan women are, um, the portrayal of them is very framed by Athenian ideas of what is normal for women. And therefore, our kind of accounts our thinking of of Spartan women as these sort of very militaristic, um, much more influential figures might be just about propaganda, anti-Spartan propaganda rather than any kind of realistic um, presentation of the work. So, you know, feminist scholarship changes things and then greater attention to things like class um, and particularly enslavement and so on and the processes of slavery and the experiences of enslaved people in Greece has kind of moved the debate further as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's kind of lots of threads coming together at once, decolonization and kind of how we study empire and colonialism in the ancient world has, has kind of come in recently too. So um, it's not that we have been ignoring these problems for decades, but it's it's taken until now to kind of really start kickstarting and bringing together mm-hmm. a kind of a fully, I suppose, intersectional way of looking at all of right. these issues. To kind of have the diversity of thought uh, and diversity yes. of scholarship to, to do this work. I think, yeah, that's, that's probably true. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that does it for my questions. And I'm just wondering if uh, you have any kind of things you want to impart on our, our viewers. Uh, is there anything that maybe you think that, uh, could be improved, for instance, uh, with subsequent civilization titles uh, or maybe DLC um, pertaining either to the Greeks or uh, to maybe any other civs uh, or game mechanics that you can think of. Well, I feel like I should say I'm not a game developer, so I may I'm fully aware that I may be asking for things which are not reasonable. That's never um, stopped think- anybody from giving <laughs> advice to game developers. So you're in good okay. company. <laughs> Um, well, I think what I would like to see really is actually kind of related to some of the things we started off talking about um, in terms of the diversity of models of progress and the diversity of kind of development of civilizations. Um, because, you know, both of the, okay, so now we've got Sparta and Athens and we've also got Macedon, but these are all still basically the same. And any of the civilizations you choose with the kind of great leaders, they will take basically the same route through life. Um, mm-hmm. They have a, a slight quirk here and there, but basically you play the game the same way. Um, and I would like to see that shaken up a bit so that choosing a different civilization has a really meaningful impact on the gameplay experience mm-hmm. as well, so that you do get an, a, a kind of impression of different ways of progressing through time and through kind of um, 
patterns in the game. You know, not everyone has to colonize, for example. It might be quite <laughs> nice to see some civilizations that are not um, really expansionist or mm -hmm. um, kind of eager to fight each other. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would that would be my my request is more diversity between the the various civilizations. Yeah, and uh, I wonder. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I wonder, you know, just looking at the tech tree here. You know, if that kind of move would require different technologies, uh, you know, because if you're talking about different ways of developing, then presumably you would also have different uh, technologies. You would have different uh, ways of organizing society that might be a little bit, uh, it might be difficult to fit in with the traditional tech tree. And I, and I wonder, you know, if players are, they kind of associate Civ with this tech tree. I wonder if they would accept that kind of change or if they would they would only accept it in something like a an expansion pack right not a part of the main game um i don't have the answer to that but i'm just i'm i'm curious uh, i think it's a great idea though well perhaps we'll find out when the comments go up um, about how many people would accept it um, but i think i mean i i'm not a huge fan of the tree structure anyway but it seems to me one thing you could do is just have similar elements but move them around mm -hmm. oh, so if okay. you have a civilization that's very focused on on travel instead of kind of settling down somewhere for example mm -hmm. put some put the sailing elements earlier in their tech tree and animal mm. husbandry much later because it's not going to be much concern to them whether or not they want to kind of farm their sheep if they haven't settled down somewhere mm -hmm. that's great okay i'm writing all of this down and i'll send uh, <laughs> i'll send our notes to fraxis uh, and we'll get some we'll get some answers um okay kate thank you so much for joining me on this episode of civs 101 thanks very much for having me